Matt, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Um, sure. First off, thank you very much for having me. I, I really appreciate the the invitation and I'm always always happy to talk about Ausatru. Um, my name's Matthew Flavel. I was born and raised in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, I am the Alz Harrier Gothi of the Ausatru Folk Assembly. And that's a, a fancy word that basically means the high priest of the Ausatru Folk Assembly. Um, been following Ausatru for 20 years this year. And I've been leading the AFA for six. Okay. Could you tell me more about Asatru? What is it? Okay, what sure. Um, all right. Well, uh, Asatru is an ethnic religion of European peoples. And it's basically the paganism that existed amongst European people before the conversion to Christianity. Um, we believe in the Aesir. As a matter of fact, the word Asatru is an old Norse word that means loyalty to the Aesir. Um, often people are confused and think it means belief in, but it, but it doesn't just mean believing in them, but being loyal to them. Um, so gods that uh, your audience would be familiar with, Odin, Thor, Freya, those gods. Um, we also, <clears throat> within Asatru practice, uh, ancestor veneration and the veneration of heroes um, and the AFA has been around 28 years this year and uh, also true in its modern form has been around since 1968. Okay and could you tell me if why should is there any evidence of why people should believe in these kinds of gods as opposed to um, the other ones that you don't believe in? Um. I think evidence is a tricky word. There's certainly reasons why I think it's advantageous for um, people of European descent to believe in uh, in these gods. And I think, like I said earlier, it's not so much just a belief in them, but it's a it's a loyalty to and it's a building a relationship with them. And uh, some of the reasoning for that is that these are our gods. They're the gods of our ancestors. Therefore. We are intimately relatable to them in a way that's not the same with, with other or different gods. Uh, I very much believe that each ethnic grouping of people have their own native beliefs and their own gods. And uh, the existence of my gods doesn't negate the existence of their gods. So it's not a you know one or the other existing thing. But I do think these are the gods that our people are most um, tied to by kinship and by our unique soul makeup. Well, I'm an atheist, so which I mean, I believe that there are no gods. I don't think there's any reason to believe in anything beyond like just physical, natural stuff. So is there any reason to believe that gods exist at all? Um. Yeah, but the, the quantification of it's really diff uh, d different. It's one of those things that's experiential. Um, trying to think of the best way to say it from my own experience, uh, I've always certainly believed in divinity in one form or another. And uh, figuring out the fine points of what to attribute that to has taken, uh, has taken a large part of my life until I was you know in my early 20s. But the belief and the assurity in my case that there's something out there beyond um i guess beyond the physical into the metaphysical is uh i think it's fairly fundamental in the human condition and it's certainly something that in my own life i've have always felt was i don't know a natural state of of existence well i think there's there's lots of natural states of existence for humans um lots of biases fallacies illusions delusions lots of things that are inbuilt in human psychology that aren't true so why would this example being inbuilt in human psychology make it reasonable to believe it's true as opposed to one of the false ones well i mean all all things aren't equal there's a spiritual need amongst people that i think has pretty much always been there um 
I'm sure there are certainly outliers and situations where that's not the case, but by and large, um, all sentient creatures on the planet, as far as by the broad stroke of society go, have had religiosity in one form or another, or belief, you know, at the most basic level in um, their ancestors looking on from an afterlife. Um, and it's, it's one of those things that's kind of fundamental to the human condition. It's like the saying, there's no atheists in foxholes. When people find themselves in moments of, you know, when everything gets stripped away intellectually, there's a tendency for people to reach out beyond the physical towards something else or towards something more. Yes. I mean, the no atheists in foxholes thing has been um, researched and there are actually many atheists in foxholes, but um, my question is more, does the fact that we have this desire mean it's true versus having a desire for a billion dollars in my bank account? I mean, most people have a desire for money in their bank account, but it's not there. And so why would this desire indicate that there is something there as opposed to it just being a desire? Well, it's, it's more than just a desire. It's a need. Um, me needing food doesn't make food appear, but me needing food makes me search after that food until that needs satisfied. Um, and, and I, you know, I have to assume this isn't my state, so I don't know, but I have to assume that atheists fill that need in, in a different way or with different conclusions than I would reach. Um, so it doesn't mean that gods exist, but it does mean that it's a question that needs to be resolved in some way and asking that question and looking for those answers have led me to the surety that our gods do exist sure i definitely agree that uh it's a question a drive that humans have to try to search for the answer but my question is more what evidence would lead you to the answer that they exist um and why would you believe that simply having the drive would do you count that as evidence for the answer? Yes. Built on the backs of the eons of human history, I think it would propel us towards the answer. Yes. Um, I don't think that it may. Evidence is a hard word because the, the standards of evidence are different than the standards that make us believe something to be true or false. Evidence is in my understanding of evidence makes it completely rock solid. And I just don't think the metaphysical works that way. Um, uh, what, could you explain what you mean by evidence? Cause I think evidence is anything that increases the likelihood a proposition is true okay. by like any, like 1% is still evidence. Okay. So I would say that the majority of human history, accepting the existence of belief in metaphysics would make it, you know, would be at least 1% in the favor of there's probably something to it. I think respecting the wisdom of our ancestors is a good place to start on believing and accepting truth. I think listening to people that you respect and that you understand, have a relationship to where you understand where they're coming from and them sharing their experiences with you of metaphysical reality would lead me towards placing credence in it as a concept and specifically, and this is something that I always suggest to people when they come from a, an atheist or an agnostic background is when you start any form of ritual work or any, any prayer or any offering, I don't feel that you have to go into that with a firm belief, but I do ask that people go into that with an open mind and an open heart and that they reach out and that they see what happens. And very often people feel very much like in a way something reached back. And I, I certainly have felt that to be true in my life. Uh, but the main question is like, mm -hmm. how do you differentiate imagination from reality? Cause when you say like you felt something reach back when I watch a scary movie at night and I have the lights out, I, I feel like there's something in the dark looking back at me, even though there's not, I can go over there, turn the lights on, nothing's there. And so we humans have these sensations of uh, hyperactive agency detection where we'll, we'll feel agency in things that don't have agency. People think that uh, monster under the bed 
shot guy lurking in the shadows um the lion in the bushes like if you hear a rustle in the bushes you're afraid because you think it's a lion when it could just be the wind um and the group of people who thought it was a lion and ran away every time survived and the group of people who are more skeptical and are going to wait to see if it like wait for a scientific test to find out if it was a lion were the ones who got eaten and so our inbuilt evolutionary biases give us this tendency to think there are agents in lots of things where there is no agency like a monster under the bed and so why would this be an example that's different from that or if we know that this is the case how do you filter out those examples where we do know it's just our psychology playing tricks with us well i think a lot of that comes with maturity and experience i think that you know whatever age or period of human development those fundamental instincts get get honed you know i think when somebody first goes in the woods the first time then yeah every rustle in the bushes must be some animal either it's what they're hunting or it's what's hunting them or certainly but the more seasoned you are the more often you're in the woods the more you can differentiate what rustling sounds like a big animal what sounds like a squirrel what might just be the wind and i think the same is true for for the others if you're watching a scary movie you're artificially stimulating that uh that impulse within yourself to feel like you're being watched but very often it's a very valuable skill if you find yourself in public and you feel like some someone's watching you i would say chances are somebody probably is so i don't think you ever shut those things off i think you use your dis or I, I don't think it's good to shut those things off i think it's good to use your discernment over your life and your life experiences and you know hone those and keep you know hone those towards a directionality science would typically say that since we know that that methodology is unreliable that our brains can't really tell the difference very well we can't count that as evidence we just go like nope it doesn't count we got to find some different way to assess is this a reliable sensation or is it a figment of our imagination that's where we have novel testable prediction double blind studies control groups these things have over time been able to filter out which things are just human imagination and which things are correspondent to reality um, and so from my perspective i would require something more along those lines rather than um feelings that we have um because i don't know of a reliable way to hone those feelings and contexts that have ever worked or ever been able to correspond to those higher level tests that science does because when people say um, that they can hone their psychological skills in such a way to detect um, astrology homeopathy uh, dowsing etc cetera, etc cetera, it always fails we tested against science double blind control studies always fails and so i've never seen cases where simply being able to hone psychological skills has given anybody any access to the fundamental nature of reality um, beyond chance essentially um, and so i would go ahead go ahead oh no what, what i was going to say with that is but we do every day on things that we trust that we don't require evidence for um, we deal with relationships with people to where we build trust relationships based on our experience of that person and oftentimes based on our intuition, based on past experiences on whether we feel we can trust a situation or not. And uh, we've learned to use that and it's certainly not infallible, but I think that people have learned to use that in a way that's been very beneficial. It's not always right, but I think that it's been a useful tool. And on the scientific studies, um, and I don't claim to be any sort of a scientist, that's, that's certainly not my claim, but I've found very often that as a, as a premise, I don't, I believe you can't out science truth. Truth exists and science is an attempt to understand or to express truth, but things are true whether we're currently able to scientifically quantify or explain them or not. True things are true objectively, I think. Um, and so I think that by whatever tool you use to come to them, the, the important part is that you're, you're accurate, not that you can you know, show your work as you'd say in math class. 
I'm not sure I understand that you can't out science truth. I think that's an interesting catchphrase. Um, but it's like knowledge is a justified true belief. It's how it's defined in philosophy. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not just a true belief. So even if you believe something that happens to be correct, unless you have a justification for it, then it wouldn't be counted as knowledge. It would be called uh, a lucky belief. So like if um, they use this, the, the example of a broken clock, a broken clock is right twice a day, but it doesn't mean you should trust the clock. The clock is pretty unreliable 99% of the time. Uh, and so the ability to show your work, as you put it, um, and to have some kind of rational justification for your belief is a integral part of what counts as knowledge. And without that, it doesn't seem to count as knowledge at all. And so I don't think I would agree that simply believing something that's true is rational because in order to have a reason to believe it's true, you have to have a justification, not just happen to be right without a justification. But track record is a is a form of justification. If if someone happens to be lucky over and over and over again, the more often that they're lucky, and, and I use lucky to, to buy into your analogy, but the more often that they're lucky, the more reliable their luck is, I'd say. Um, whether, you know, I think that we live in a day and age that isn't entirely fair to you either in this. Um, because of the corporate nature of a lot of science, you can find studies that tell you very often contradictory facts because of parameters and because of, you know, chicanery that's gone on in the studies, which makes it really hard to rely on that. Well, I'm not sure I would agree. I'd say that there are different studies that are done from different perspectives to highlight different facts, but none of the facts are contradictory. They all agree. They just seem contradictory when you phrase it in a certain way. Like if you say that the number of people who have died from malaria in the past um, 100 years in a particular city has gone up by 600%. And and that sounds like a lot, but really it was just, it went up from one person to six people. Um, if the study of the focus, if the focus of the study is the percentage that it's gone up, obviously it looks higher than it is, but it's still true that it went up 600%. It's just a smaller number well, than what you would expect. We've, we've seen this recently in the, with the COVID studies though, depending on if they were, as the recording data, number of deaths from COVID record, depending on where you're at, people who died with COVID, people who died of complications that may have included COVID and people who, you know, legitimately died of the disease, depending on the study that you read, those numbers were radically all over the place. And that's just with a very cursory, you know, analysis that I was able to do. And that's, you know, not exhaustive at all. Um, that's yeah, because usually whether you die at a particular time, COVID very rarely kills you ever. It's, comorbidities that kill you and so COVID is usually never the cause of death in and of itself and so the way that medical professionals assign cause of death were standardized by like the CDC and so if you're using the CDC metric you get a specific answer but they're all true they're all still using the same data you just have to know how to read it um you know I've known people in the the death reporting field that are required to write down cause of death COVID when it's a suicide and the person had COVID. Um, I'll, my whole point is during that, we all heard different statistics over and over and over again on the news. The truth is the truth regardless, whether those studies are honest attempts to tabulate the truth is a question. And then how close they came to achieving that goal is also a question, but I don't think any of those are beyond reproach. And I think that we saw a vast disparity in that. But I, I'm not trying to debate you about the COVID. I just wanted to say that science, truth is perfect. Science is not perfect. Science is an attempt towards perfection, but the truth is out there and exists. And we're trying to approach it through different means, science being one of those means. Right. But I would say that's I don't know of any method that gets closer. I think that you can't get perfect truth. Your, your goal is to 
have a justification that's the highest accuracy you can get. And as far as I know, the most reliable source of justification is science, novel testable predictions. Mm -hmm. And I don't know of another methodology that comes anywhere near it. And, mm -hmm. and so in the case of personal experience, personal experience seems to be incredibly unreliable. Um, ex you mentioned that there are some cases where we do trust our personal experience and our intuitions. And that is like, if you saw a murderer or something, that's perfectly legitimate evidence in court cases and history where people saw they said somebody killed somebody else or whatever historical accounts. But in both legal and historical epistemology, it's never evidence to have a testimony of miracles, magic, mythical creatures, paranormal, supernatural, UFOs. None of those things are counted as evidence that they actually exist um, because of the prevalence of psychological errors in humanity. And so I agree that there are cases where you can trust personal intuition and personal testimony in cases of things that already have been empirically demonstrated. Mm -hmm. But in the context of things that have no empirical demonstration, like gods or magic or miracles, it doesn't count for anything. It's not, if you go into a court of law and say, I saw a UFO, they just throw it out or a God or a God's uh, killed this guy with a lightning bolt or something. They just throw it out because mm -hmm. eyewitness testimony isn't reliable in those kinds of contexts. Um, and so I don't think those would be count as something like science as a way to get closer to truth. Um, and science would be the more reliable way to go here, even though, of course, you can try to manipulate data and try to manipulate statistics. It's still going to be more accurate than trusting personal experience in this context. Um, I could see why you feel that way. And I think some of this is why I initially had the reluctance to use the term evidence, because there does tend to be a courtroom standard that's applied. And if my evidence is sentencing you to harm, then yeah, the standard needs to be much higher. If my evidence is to get you to give something a shot that could make your life better, the threshold's much lower. If I say, hey, try this pizza, it's good. You risk very little by giving it a shot and maybe it's great. My thing that my example that I mentioned on ritual is, hey, if you don't know, if you're uncertain or if you would like it to be true, give it a shot and see if you find truth in it. And I think that's the starting point. So, you know, the, the, the premise was, is it uh, like, does it make, I think that the, that I was invited on was like, does it make sense to practice also true? And to me it does. So the starting point of, I feel a very strong religious need that need wasn't satisfied by Christianity because I felt that was morally unjustified yet. I still needed to fill it. So I looked to my ancestors. I said, what did generations of people like me believe before Christ? I took that as a starting point to develop my own relationship with the gods. And my life has dramatically improved in proportion to the involvement in Ausatru that, that I've had. And I genuinely believe wholeheartedly that when I reach out, and I participate in the gift cycle with my gods that I'm blessed. And I think that the, I am satisfied with the payoff in my life because of, of that uh, relationship that I've chose to engage in. And so are, are a great many people that I know that uh, share the faith with me. Well, sure. I wouldn't say it's um, like unjustified to practice any particular belief system. I think if, if it makes you happy, go for it. Um, but I'd be more interested to know, like, is it true is the, my question. And I would want to know what is the method to differentiate imagination from reality? And you mentioned that there's different standards of evidence. And uh, I would agree, like for a hypothesis, you can use whatever you want. You can just shake a magic eight ball. You can come up with a hypothesis, perfectly rational. But how do you show does that hypothesis correspond to reality? And that standard of evidence does it correspond to reality is the higher standard the like legal standard science standard whatever i don't think you can the say standard, something the, not the standard for engaging in an action the standard for imposing that action on someone else might be that higher standard but i think we do things at a much lower threshold a lot um there's a saying that i think is is applicable to not let perfect be the enemy of good. I think when we grapple, which 
theologians and philosophers have always done with the bigger picture and the, the greater meanings in life. Just because we can't arrive at perfection doesn't mean we can't rely or we can't arrive at some good things that take us closer than we currently are and improve our lives. Sure, but things can improve our lives without being true. And so the fact that something would improve our lives wouldn't indicate something's true. It might imply that something is true. How? Then, is that to me that sounds like uh, in philosophy appeal to consequence fallacy? The mm -hmm. fact that something's good or has a good outcome, therefore it's true, doesn't really follow. Like things can have a good outcome without being true all the time. Um, they can, but just because it's a philosophic rule of debate doesn't mean that it's ironclad. Um, many of those fallacies, they're a fallacy in the sense that they are not absolute, but it doesn't mean they're not good indicators. Um, you know, appeal to authority. An authority of something telling you something when you know less about it is a pretty good place to start that something, you know, there may be something to it. Um, I think that's how most humans start, certainly as children and young adults, is trusting people who've, who've been there before and who've, you know, testified to it's worked well for them. Um, the benefits that I've received in my life because of my relationship with my gods, I'm certain that you could propose many alternate explanations for those things. Yet, I have engaged in the gift cycle and I have benefited while doing that. It implies to me that the two are related. I see the commonality when others who share my faith have engaged in a similar situation. Um, my life is full of meaning that it did not have before. I am a better person than I was before. I am benefited in a great many ways and it correlates pretty directly with my involvement and my interaction with my gods. One of the things that we see as the gods acting in the world is, uh, is synchronicity. When synchronicity occurs disproportionately, or when you notice auspicious things continuing to occur, to occur at auspicious moments, we very much believe that that's the gods, you know, acting and revealing themselves in some way or the ancestors or other metaphysical folks beyond the veil. Certainly there's a million other explanations, but when they add up and they have a level of consistency, that's more credence towards believing that there's something intelligent behind them. Well, that's something I would uh, have issue with because from my understanding appeal to consequence fallacy um coincidences those things are things that humans look at and try to find meaning in all the time like when if you look at a clock and it says 3 33 p.m or whatever you're like oh it's a pattern you see this there's 333 this is special but really it's just a survivor bias because you just don't remember all the other times you look at the clock and it's like 245 or whatever um and so we see patterns and they stick out to us in our brains because our brains have been designed to look for patterns. And it's not, and so that we, we every time we look at the clock and it says 3.33 or something, it's like, wow, this is really special. But when we actually compare that to um, the rest of the data, it's not special at all. It's just, it's just we think it's special that those particular instances stick out to us um, and seem statistically relevant because it's what we remember, what, what comes to our mind when, but when we compare it to the actual data, it's not statistically relevant. And so all of those cases where we see these synchronous, synchronistic kinds of effects, we have to compare and say, is this really there or is it just our brain seeing things that aren't there? So we have to compare, does the result happen at a higher rate than chance or is it just chance rate? Um, um, and so, no, we don't. I mean, you, you may want to and you may choose to, but we don't have to do that. We can take those things at the face value that we feel they are. We can act accordingly and we can gauge the results. We don't have to arrive at perfect truth on them in order to do that. 
we can choose to do that and we can choose to do it consistently by doing so i think a lot of us have had our lives drastically improve well sure i would agree with that i mean i'd say the same thing about christians or hindus or muslims or any particular religion they believe in their um, religious faith they believe that they're getting signs from their particular gods and or deities or whatever um, thing they believe in and that gives them sensations of hope and meaning and purpose and guidance that they then use to gain an emotional benefit from but i would want to say that until you can show that all of the things you're saying are at a higher rate than chance i don't think it's rational to believe from my position i want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible and if we can take the data that you're presenting and compare it to um whatever scientific methods we have and show that nope it's just the exact same rate as chance even if it had a benefit in your life i'd still think that would essentially prove it to be false because it was just the same as chance um and so I don't see the connection between the statistical data and the benefit. Both of those things seem to be a dubious basis for belief from, from my perspective, because I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. Well, I, I suppose um, some of that's just a question of, I don't know, hierarchy of, of values or what you're shooting for. Um, I mean, Certainly, I think we would all say that we want to believe true things and not believe false things. But as far as the hierarchies of values in people's lives, many of us would say that, you know, one of the highest values is to have a meaningful life and to be successful in your life, to be fulfilled with your family, with your position in your community, with your relationship to the world around you. A lot of those things, I think, come before I'd say a courtroom standard of evidentiary truth for a lot of people. You may not be one of those people, but I do think that's true for a lot of us. Would you say that simply because people put it before, if we can demonstrate that it happens at the same rate of chance that it's rational to place it before. So like I can put my faith in a lottery ticket or whatever, and I could potentially win. But does that mean that I was rational to to buy a lottery ticket? I would say no. It's, the probability you're going to win is very, very low. So it's not rational to buy a lottery ticket. It's not rational to go to a casino. Um, and the fact that many people gain meaning and purpose and value and money from doing this um, doesn't mean it's necessarily a good thing. So like say somebody's had the religion of the, the Vegas casino and they said um, – I adopted this lucky rabbit's foot and I take the lucky rabbit's foot into a casino every time I see the stars align or whatever. And I win occasionally about a thousand dollars. Um, and he says that this has benefited his life quite greatly. He's, he's gotten money. He's been him happiness. He's become more fulfilled. Um, and as a scientist, I'm going like, well, that's nice. I'm, I'm happy for you. But if we compare your success rate to the success rate of everyone in general, the success, the ability for you to make a um, success in this particular instance, isn't isn't a thing that's outside of the realm of chance. Some people are going to win. In fact, casinos have to pay out uh, in a slot machine has to pay out eighty cents on a dollar to back to people, and so we know that some people are going to win. Um, does that mean that your lucky rabbit's foot? has some correspondence to reality that it's actually telling us about luck. Well, no, that's no, if it was doing that, then you'd see some kind of disproportionate amount of success rate, not an exactly proportional success rate to the statistical data. And so if I'm trying to compare which model is a better description of reality, I think the scientific one is a better description of reality in this context. And if I want to believe what's true, I should probably believe the science one, the science interpretation rather than the lucky rabbit's foot interpretation. And I don't, see the difference between that example and um, your faith and other faiths in this context? Well, you know, I, I think that raises some interesting points. Um, you're proposing a data set that's infallible and includes every other person that goes into a casino under the same circumstances. Um, but the only variable, uh, variable being the rabbit's foot what if the gentleman who had the rabbit's foot 
is consistently unlucky in his own life and his life has been a series of failures. At the moment he gets the rabbit's foot, things start looking up and he starts winning. He goes to the casino, he wins more often than he loses, gets his life together, is successful and is happy. I would say there's something that has to do with his rabbit's foot and so would he and his inability to demonstrate it to you would not make it any less true or any less reasonable for him to believe. Why not? Because from my perspective, it would. It would be like, if the guy believes that it has an effect and he's had this change in his life, he's unlucky his whole life, gets the rabbit's foot and he wins occasionally, but then we test it against the data and show that it's no, not statistically different from any of the other cases where uh, casino payouts are registered. Um, that seems like a very good reason for him to doubt in his rabbit's foot rather than continue with the belief that it's actually a rabbit's foot or he, he would like give the rabbit's foot out to other people. So you do these people win at this rate or um, test different casinos at different times, do a controlled study where he tests, has the rabbit foot, goes in 10 times, does goes in without the rabbit's foot and they measure the exact amount of money he gambles and the amount of money he wins. And we do this a hundred times in a row. But why Captain would he data. do that? He's winning. And he's happy. Why on earth would he do that? Um, to verify his belief that it corresponds to reality. So I would say that um, if he did that, that would prove one way or the other if his belief was true or if it was just chance. And if he, and I would want to know that. I would want to be like, is this something, some fact about reality that I'm talking about or that I'm experiencing? Or is it just a psychological phenomenon in my human brain? Um, so, and that would be important, I think, for most people. Well, you know, I, I don't know if it would for most people. I think that, um, you know, certainly it would for you. And I think as a person who's a self-described atheist, I think that, you know, those folks are probably would be very important for because that is a self-identifier that you guys have have chosen to label yourself with. Um, I think for people of faith, not as much. And I don't think it's it's due to, you know, gullibility or anything else. I think the efficacy of the situation in their life that they found to be working works. And by continuing to act as though it doesn't, there's a certain amount of impiety in that that might negate it's continuing to work. Um, and I mean, we're talking about a, a rabbit's foot here to put it in a, I don't know, more mundane context. But if you have a genuine faith relationship in your God and it is benefiting you in ways that, that you are truly appreciative of, if you are constantly trying to disprove it through, you know, whatever, whatever uh, double blind testing or whatever you choose to do, I think in and of itself, that would negate that trust relationship and damage the efficacy of your relationship. Um, I've seen a lot of people that, again, make perfect the enemy of, the, of good and spend their entire life testing to try to get 100% ironclad proof of, of a belief or a value system and I've seen them waste their entire adult life. You know, my, my uncle's like that. My uncle was died at 50. Um, and he was one of those guys that, you know, in the in the 70s, he really prided, he really prided himself on uh always searching and you know, questing after truth or whatever, but his life never in, in, improved because of it. Um he never got any closer to it. He just was able to, to his satisfaction, disprove a whole lot of things. And he died alone and unhappy and, and unfulfilled. There's a lot of people of faith that when they feel they're in a beneficial faith relationship and they believe wholeheartedly in what they're doing, they don't forever try to test that because that's not something we typically do in relationships. And therefore they're happy and fulfilled and have, you know, very beneficial lives. Which, sure, I would, I would agree that we don't do that in relationships because we have examples, like if you love your wife or something, that's something that's 
uh, like in a courtroom, something very mundane. We have that. We saw somebody saw that guy murder that guy or saw a dog yesterday going across the street or something. But if someone said they had a relationship with an alien uh, artif like or, or some kind of being from another universe or something, that would be very different than saying you had a relationship with uh, another human being from Albuquerque or something. Um, and so uh, there's that statement that many um, scientists, philosophers have used, you should proportion your beliefs to the evidence or um, something along those lines. And so if the, or extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence would be another good one. Um, so if you have a claim of a relationship with a being that is beyond humanity and we have no scientific evidence of any such being, then I think that the standard of evidence of you should look for to justify that belief would be higher than one of a claim that you have a relationship with your wife or whatever. And I think that the correct epistemology is the kind that tries to destroy all beliefs. I like, I like that. I like that analogy you used that we should try to prove it wrong as much as possible because we have this inbuilt bias to want to believe things that make us happy. And the way to overcome that bias is to try to um, destroy all the things that make us happy, uh, scientifically at least, not literally. And if we can't do it, then that's a very good justification to believe it's true. That's why the scientific method works. And I think that more people have been made happy because of that method than any other method. Like this method of trying to destroy false beliefs um, is how we got the penicillin and uh, anti-vaccines, um, atomic um, energy, nuclear energy, wind power, solar, light discoveries, like all of these things where somebody said, that guy's wrong. I think that that theory is wrong. I'm going to try to disprove it. And that's the entire history of science, which seems to have made more people happier than literally everything else combined ever, as far as I can tell. So one of the points I wanted to make earlier is I think coming at it from an objective rather than a subjective angle is yields different conclusions and a, a different trajectory. Um, and I, I believe religion is fundamentally about relationship building. Certainly also true is, um, and we don't apply those scientific, well, okay. We have all known people who have trust issues that do apply that to mundane relationships or to relationships with their wives, with their parents, with their friends, and end up with broken marriages and no friendships and estranged from their family because they're constantly trying to put it to the test or they're constantly suspicious. I think in relationship senses, we know much more people who are happy because they found the level to where they feel that they can trust someone and therefore they proceed with their life in the trust relationship. I think we see more of that anecdotally in our lives than we do the other way around where you've tried to test somebody in every possible way that you could possibly test them through the mill and they you know, have somehow come out worthy of your trust at the end of your life when you haven't enjoyed your relationship with them because of it. Um, we're working under a different premise as well. You're assuming that the person, the person in question that's uh, pursuing faith doesn't believe it, therefore needs to believe it. If you start from a position that you were satisfied with the proof that you're given, you're satisfied with your personal revelation or your personal religious experience that you are getting what you've asked for. Why would that person then step back from that position of confidence in what they're gratified with to question it to death to where they've convinced themselves to go back to square one and be unhappy? I'd say that's what um, honest investigation entails. It's like, I believe something that makes me happy. 
Mm -hmm. um, but if I want to honestly investigate this and try to filter out my personal biases to know if it's true, you would want to um, doubt yourself. You want to doubt the things you care about more than the things you don't care about, like doubting that the moon is 255,000 miles away. Who cares? It's a number. It makes no difference. But if you have a vested interest in believing somebody, like uh, your cousin said they didn't kill that guy, the fact that they're your cousin and you care about them isn't a reason you should believe them. Um, we know that people who have family relationships, familiar relationships, are bad judges of character when it comes to, did that person commit that crime? Like, no, my son would never do that. He's such a good person, the grandmother says. Um, and so we know that that bias inbuilt within us is a not a reliable way to understand reality, even if it makes you happy. It makes you happy to believe that your son didn't kill that guy and that you're, he would never do such a thing would definitely make the person happier to not believe that was the case, that he was like a monster or something. doesn't mean it's true though. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I think honest investigation, if you're really invested in trying to know the truth, you would want to do that from my perspective. Well, I think that that's a, I think it's a very artificial standard. And I think that we're applying it in this case, but I don't think that's typically what we do with things. Um, you started with the premise of, well, if we're trying to investigate, why are we trying to investigate? If I've reached out in a certain way, I've made religious offerings, I've received positive results, I continue to do so and continue to receive positive results, why would I, it would be fundamentally impious to distrust that without some breach of trust from the other side to try to disprove it rather than to take it at uh, at face value. If someone gives you a gift, you don't forensically analyze it. That's not the typical response. You say thank you and you, you enjoy your gift. Um, I, I mean, and dealing with divinity or not divinity is its own very unique situation. So. I mean, I, when we make analogy, the best we can do is compare it to other things that we think have similar points. So I, I admit that, but I'm comparing it to relationships because I do believe it's a relationship thing and not a science thing. It may be both in some degrees, but I approach religiosity through relationship much more than I do through empiricism. Hmm. Why? Because I don't, certainly there is a, a better word for this, but for lack of a better term, because I think my gods are persons, like your producer approached me politely and asked me to be on your program. When I had a scheduling issue, I offered to figure out something on my end and you offered to completely go out of your schedule to have the interview with me. That established a level of trust that I'm assuming you're going to treat me well. And until I know differently, I'm also going to treat you well. And that's how I engage in any relationship with any new person that I interact with or meet. I apply that, um, I guess with a, I don't know, a bigger frequency or on a, a higher level, I suppose, with a divinity, but fundamentally that's the position that I, that I work from because I feel that's the, the right thing to do when I interact with another person. So certainly it's the right thing to do to interact with my gods. So like my concern would be, is it sounds like a way to, filter out mm, counter examples or something along that line. So it would be like, if in science, if I do a test and it gets a result, it's just here, like combine this chem chemical, with this chemical either works or it doesn't work. There's no ambiguity. But if it's a relationship, the person, the person you're in a relationship can just say no or something. So like if I pray to a God for a gold brick and he says, no, 
that's not mm-hmm. disconfirming evidence in some way, in some sense, because the God has an option. Mm-hmm. And so in this context of relationships, it's it seems like an out in a way that um, it gives a way for the, hypothet- the hypothesis to have a negative result without falsifying the hypothesis. I suppose it can. Um, there's certainly no conscious effort on my part to do that. I think that, I think some of these come into play in a much bigger sense when you talk about Abrahamic faiths to where the buy-in is much higher and the stakes are much higher. Um, my gods, you know, I have no reason to believe that my gods are asking me to forsake major value in my own life in order to worship them or in order to be in a relationship with them. Um, Therefore, I don't have that obligation to like, wow, I need to reconsider this ad nauseum because, you know, my God's asking me to, you know, be a virgin my whole life or to, you know, build up all of my stores in heaven and not do anything while I'm on earth or some other situations that other faiths suggest. And I think were I in that predicament, it would cause me to examine it much more critically. Um, The exchange of energies with our gods is much more of a voluntary arrangement by both parties. Um, I have no compelling reason to try to force you to practice house of truth. That's not a tenet of my faith. I could suggest it to you because I think it would benefit your life, but I have no obligation to try to somehow compel you to or convince you to by a preponderance of the evidence. Um, I chose to enter that relationship and in a corresponding time frame and to a corresponding degree, my life has been greatly benefited. That is a common data point amongst people who are involved in uh, my organization. So that lends us to feel that we're doing something right and we're getting it right to some degree. I also don't presume to know the be all and the end all of the divine or to hold them to my standards of understanding, but I very much am satisfied with the level that they have interacted in my life and revealed themselves to me to where I don't, I don't have a question. So I, I wouldn't question or, or further investigate that because I feel I'd be impious. Gotcha. We have a few questions from the audience, if you don't mind. Of course. Uh, Martin asks, does Matt think that uh, unbelievers are by default searching for belief in a God or gods? I think that by default, they are compelled to. I think they could very well have ended that search in concluding that they don't believe in one. But I do think that's a, a fundamental inborn curiosity that they have. Gotcha. Um, Tim asks, what is the cost of apostasy? Apostas. Okay. I'm taking apostasy in this sense to mean going from a place of belief in our gods to rejecting that belief and speaking against it. Yeah. I think there'd be two things there. One is just simply not believing and, and two would be being in the faith and then leaving it. So on the first case, I don't think that there is a cost other than you are missing out on the benefit of that faith. I think natural processes carry on naturally. I think you have a tremendous amount of of benefit from having a relationship with the divine, but I don't believe you're, you know, punished eternally if you don't. I also don't believe I think you miss out on some of the possible elevation of yourself after after death because of it but i don't think there's there's any kind of lash that you get because of it um if you are in a relationship with our gods and you violate it or you you choose to break from it and then you choose to reject it and speak out against it i think that you have um created bad faith and a break of frith, which is a really specialized Austro-True concept, but basically you've gone against a fundamental agreement that 
you had with your community, with your gods and with your ancestors. And I think there's a, um, a debt to be paid that way with your, your weird. And for those that aren't familiar, I think that's similar in a way to karma. It's not exactly the same, but I think that's the closest idea that capsulates it. But again, I don't think, I think our gods have more important things to do than to personally pick at you and try to punish you. Gotcha. Um, Benjamin asks, what would cause you to doubt your beliefs? It's a good question. Um, It's hard to answer, and it's not because I, I'm closed off to the concept. I think it's important to reevaluate why you believe things perpetually. I think you learn things either way that way. Um, it's hard because my faith is very sincere, so it's hard for me to imagine a situation where it wouldn't be true. For Okay, so for an example, when I was a much younger man, I did. I was a Christian, and I believed in Christianity. But as I mentioned about Alcetru, it's not just believing in the existence of my gods, it's being in a relationship of loyalty to them. Well, with Christianity, it's not that I rejected a belief in a deity that ancient Jewish people worshipped and named Jehovah or some variant. It was because fundamentally I felt the God of the Bible was, for lack of a better term, a bad person. And if that were the case, regardless, I did not want to be associated with that person that I felt was morally inappropriate. So if fundamentally I learned of my gods that all of the things that I felt were true about their character were somehow fundamentally untrue or different, then I think that would change the nature of our relationship. I don't think it would cause me not to believe they exist, but it would change the, the relationship that we're in in terms of loyalty. Do you not think that the Norse gods, for example, are bad just like the Christian god is in some sense? Because like, they do equally as bad things some, sometimes. Um, no, I don't think they do equally as bad things. And the other thing is there's no... Abrahamism is very unique in the fact that it's a literal faith. And within its own tenets, it says that everything written in the Bible is divinely inspired and useful for a variety of purposes and it's all the word of God or that the Quran is the word of Allah or whatever that case may be. No, our lore is a collection of stories that teach us truth through poetic descriptions of things, but I don't think it's a chronological listing of specific actions that take place in a, in a historical sense. I think those actions are mythic and take place in mythic time. And I think they're described in a poetic way. Um, so in that sense, I can't hyper analyze a story from the Eddas and claim that it's, you know, divine writ and that specifics of our God's behavior is inappropriate. Now there's characters in the Eddas that you can like Loki, Every character or er, everything that he does is m malicious to one degree or another is, and is an agency for chaos. So whether I believe he did the exactness of that, that behavior, I certainly know that the totality tells me he is a force of chaos that seeks to break trust with the Aesir. And so I make a judgment that way. But I, I, the engagement of, of whether of the literal truth of a book is, I think, what makes that a very, very different standard. Gotcha. Um, uh, Martin asked, does Matt believe in the separation of church and state? That it should be or that it exists? Uh, that it should be, I believe. Um, that's a social contract issue in the society that you're in. When society was homogenous, no, I think they function as one and the same because I think our gods are fundamentally the tribal gods of our people. Um, when you're in a multicultural state like many of many modern states, I think you've got to, you've got to re-examine that.
That's a no? You think there should not be separation between church and state? No, it's a condition. It, it's a depends on the condition, the homogeneity or not homogeneity of the people who find themselves in that state. To tomorrow decide America needs to be a religious state and then to pick the relatively, you know, the population that you're going to choose whose religion decides it fundamentally violates the relationship that we're all in as Americans. If we were living a thousand years ago and we are all a particular Germanic tribe, then yes, that faith should be part of this state that is that tribe. And we see that with most ancient cultures. All right. Um, Mr. Creenan asked, Matt, are your gods be God's beings independent of a living mind to think of them? Yes. Um, do they live inside of space time or like, cause the Christian idea is that it's outside of space time. Is it like, are they like beings still in the universe somewhere? Again, I, I premised earlier, I'm not a, I'm not a scientist, so I don't want to misspeak, but I believe our gods exist. <sighs> Say yes and no. I think our gods exist outside of space-time, but interact within it, if that makes sense. Like the stories in the Eddas, I believe they exist in mythic time. I think that they are going to happen, happening, and have happened simultaneously. I, I realize that's an odd concept, but I, I think that's the case with mythic time. But I do think they interact in, in, in our world, certainly in the ways they interact with their followers. Gotcha. Um, Blaster Master asks, I like to set a positive model of behavior for others. Do you think using your method could allow someone to arrive at harmful beliefs? Like I couldn't, I take the same approach towards jihadism. I think that people could take anything to any amount of crazy or that's not even fair to any amount of extremism based on a lot of factors. But what I will say is, there's no reason to do that in our corpus of belief. There's no admonition in our scripture to do so as there is in you know, the Quran, for example, you mentioned jihadism. Um, that's not a tenet of our faith and you don't find that in our corpus of lore. And I have no reason to believe that's true. What I do think is fundamentally true based on the question that you asked, um, our relationship with the divine isn't that the divine send us on missions to do stuff. Our relationship with the divine is very much wanting them to be proud of us by living nobly and by doing great deeds to bring pride to them. So I think fundamentally that primes you towards being the best person you can be and towards high achievement. Okay. Uh, no name asks what else in your life causes you to have a lower epistemic bar like you do for the gods um well i mentioned um relationship wise you i tend to approach a relationship with a person from a place of trust until i know different base my valuation of them on how they've treated me in the past to predict how they will treat me in the future. Um, I, I mentioned I did that with this show. I do that with, you know, anyone I meet. I do that. Um, I'd like, like, I'm assuming this isn't a trick question. I'm assuming this is a forthright question. I'm assuming that you're a reasonable person. I'm assuming all of these things as an initial assumption because that's that's my default setting in in a relationship if you were to come back on the side with with comments that would that would change that then then i would i would change my my setting accordingly gotcha um abigail asks can you read my mind i have zero interest in gods or not but uh, i do have an innate curiosity and yearning and was I born lacking color blinds or something? I think referring to it like a god. So this would be a great testable prediction if you could read somebody's mind. That would be great evidence for sure. No, I, 
I wish I could I wish I could say yes and prove that to you. That would be awesome. Um, there may be somebody out there that can do that, but I am not that guy. Um, I would venture, though, if uh, if you do feel something, but you're uncomfortable with divinity. One thing that I think is very approachable is ancestor reverence towards your loved ones that have passed. That might be fulfilling to you if you were to open yourself in that way. Gotcha. Um, Vlad the Stoner asks, do you believe your religion is the correct and true religion and why? I don't believe that my religion negates other religions. I think that when there's a religion like um, Christianity, Islam, or, or current Judaism that demand theirs is the one true faith and everything else isn't true, that's not what I believe. That's not what Alistair True believes. So I don't know how to answer your question other than I believe that my faith is true. I think that it is the correct faith for people of European descent. I don't think it negates other faiths except for faiths that suggest they're the only truth. And I think it negates them in so much as they aren't the only truth, but up to that extent. Gotcha. Uh, no name asked. So all the bad things Yahweh did were poetic metaphors, or I think he's asking like you could interpret Christianity that way, just like you said, like you interpreted your religious belief that way. Well, I, I don't think that, I don't think that you can because it's always been a core tenet. Okay. So I don't want to overspeak. Um, there are Gnostic Christians that may say that, but if your Christianity means accepting the Bible, then the Bible within its own text says, you know, disclaimer, this is all completely 100% true. And that's always been a foundational um, tenet of that. Same with, uh, with Islam. Uh, I believe that Yahweh existed before organized Judaism. And I do believe that it was originally one of several Semitic um, tribal gods. So I think in maybe that very original sense, that corpus of lore that we don't have access to, maybe you could take it that way. But I think that in the way that Christianity or Islam has been presented to me, they have put themselves at that standard. There has never been that claim amongst uh, the religious texts of my faith. Gotcha. And uh, Matt asked, so nothing could convince you that your gods don't exist, only that they were immoral or change your relationship with them? I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to say that an unknown circumstance couldn't happen that would, you know, the curtain goes back and like, ha ha, it was me all along. Um, I don't know. I mean, the circumstance seems preposterous to me that that something like that could occur, but I don't want to be so ignorant to say that's not a possibility. What I do say is I currently feel 100% certain that my gods exist. All of the facts of exactly how and exact mechanisms I'm up for, for, you know, um, refining my understanding of that. I don't claim to know all of that. But I do know that when I reach out to Odin, Odin, he, a being that answers to Odin, hears me and um, has participated in a gifting cycle with me. The particulars of that are up for discussion, but the, the fact of it is not to my mind. It's I 100% believe that that's true. Gotcha. Uh, Big Bag Mama asks, how does his particular Asatru Church teach LG, treat LGBT folks? Um, I think our default stance is to treat anyone kindly, but we do believe that uh, LGBT and the other things along with that as regards sexuality and gender identity are um, tragic mental illness. And we wish those people would get back to good health all right and i think that was it for the questions right. we've been going for a little over an hour it was a great conversation thanks for having me on really appreciate it and do you want to give any links or references where people can find more about your work 
Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, look up Ausa True Folk Assembly here on YouTube if you want to check out our channel and see what we're up to. Also, our website is runestone.org. Feel free to reach out there. We have contacts and you know the, the incorporation documents of who we are and what we believe. Thank you so much for having me on tonight. It's been great to talk to you. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your night. Good night.